welcome to Marketing. I'm Ken Allen, your host, and Marketing is a program that's brought to you by your local Lutheran church. And we take a look at personalities and issues that we hope are of some interest to our faith community and to citizens in general. And today our topic is religion and right-wing extremism. And our guest is no stranger to this show. He's uh, Dr. Rudy Sieber from Western Michigan University, who is professor of religion and society there. Welcome, Rudy. Nice to have you back. Thank you. And I guess you've been away for a while, something like nine months, That's you've right. told me. Yes. And I'm sure you have a lot to share with uh, our viewers and, uh, and with me. And particularly on this topic of right-wing extremism and how that right-wing extremism somehow gets supported sometimes by and confirmed by religion. Right. So where do we start? Well, um, during those uh, uh, nine months, I uh, went through five countries. So I taught in Canada, in, um, in Jugosla ex-Jugoslavia, and in uh, uh, Germany, and in uh, Denmark, and in, in Hungary. So, uh, and wherever I came in all of these um, five countries, and where I worked, um, there were present this what is called right-wing extremism nowadays, yeah, right. which would mean a certain neo-nationalism and a certain neo-fascism in, in certain cases. Yes. So you mean uh, that, uh, well, for example, let's take a, 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 an item like uh, Adolf Hitler, who uh, is uh, still uh, in many of our minds uh, a leader who, uh, a very disgraceful and tragic leader in time and history, who uh, by his decision caused 50 million deaths in the world. Uh, and uh, you know when we see uh, the swastikas and uh, uh, neo-Nazism, it's, it's kind of repugnant to us. Right. Uh, and yet evidently it's not seeming too uh, repugnant to well, a number I mean, of people. It is repugnant you know, to the center people in, of uh, liberal democratic societies, as repugnant as it always was. Yeah. <laughs> but um, on the right, you know, one sees that sign, one sees the swastika in railroad stations, you know, in, in oh, East yes. Germany, for in West Germany, and so on. And uh, never before in the last 50 years did I hear the name of Hitler mentioned so often. Is that and right? it is mentioned, you know, his tragedy is mentioned, his heroism is mentioned, his heroic death in Berlin which cost 60,000, uh, um, uh, 600,000 Russians their lives and so on. Yeah. So um, uh, this name comes up, uh, yes, that's right. And so uh, very often I remember that uh, Goering in the uh, Nuremberg trial, during the Nuremberg trial, uh, said, you know, in this two-week speech, he said, 50 years from now, you will build many monuments for us. And now, you know, Boy, Stalin... Well, it's starting I, to happen. I hope not, but... Uh, now the monuments are empty, Stalin is gone, and, uh, you know, sometimes already the name of uh, the old fascist appears on these empty monuments now. Is this basically, it's, it's kind of a struggle, isn't it, between either nationalism or sometimes that's, part of that is fascism and socialism? Uh, yeah. I think it is some kind of a movement, you know, of waves in the in 1930s. Of course, the fascists won over the socialists. So uh, Benito Mussolini was a socialist first and then made a fascist revolution, and the same thing with Hitler, Salazar, Franco, and so on. Then in the 40s, of course, the, uh, um, the uh, 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 socialists won over fascism mm -hmm. uh, in Stalingrad, in Kursk, and in Berlin. Um, and in 1989, of course, now the nationalists and so on and the right-wing extremism comes up again while socialism has uh, withdrawn in, in a certain sense, right? So what the next uh, movement will be, we don't know, but this is where we stand now. So it is not new in that sense. We no. should have known, you know, that with the uh, uh, collapse of the so-called real socialism, that probably the nationalists would come into the foreground again, and so it happened. So we have a uh, um, uh, somehow presidential dictatorship, nationalist one in Russia. We have a democratic right? dictatorship in Croatia. That yeah. is what it's called. You know, yeah. th these are the names which are used in Europe. I so uh, it somehow was to be expected, but we didn't want to expect it. We thought there would be a liberal democratic society everywhere, parliamentarism and, and uh, yes. free market yes. and so on. I think it was a surprise to Gorbachev and to us, to our government and so on, that this nationalism would break out again in, with such power as yeah. it has now, yes. We, see, we have seen and witnessed, continue to witness the breakup of Yugoslavia. Yes. And uh, we have people there, factions, fighting against uh, one another. Mm -hmm. 
And, and is, is that pretty much along the lines of uh, a national, a nationalism versus socialism? Or are there other elements in that struggle, or what? What's, yeah. what's happening? It, it depends, you know, on whose side one is. So recently I wrote a 56-page article on war and peace uh, uh, for a Yugoslav, uh, I mean, a Croatian mm -hmm. newspaper, and they mm -hmm. accepted it, except mm -hmm. I had to change the word civil war. Mm -hmm. So from a Croatian point of view, civil war would mean that a nation broke up into three parties, you know, Serbs and Croats and Islamic people, and they struggle with each other and so on. But they uh, don't want this. That is the wrong picture, according to them. According to them, the Serbs, Serbian nationalism, somehow made the attack on Croatia I and see. on Bosnia-Herzegovina and the Islamic people. And so by just leaving out that little word now, civil, uh, as mm -hmm. it was here with us, mm -hmm. only the North called our war a civil war, the South did not, and so on. No. So uh, this little word shows somewhat that uh, the Croats think it is a nationalist war but only from the Serbian side for uh, Greater Serbia and so I on, see, not a nationalist Croat war. It's always nice or helpful to have the moral argument on your side, if, if, that's, if that's right. possible. That's right. Yeah, I think with regard to the North and South of the United States, maybe the, the South referred to it as the war between the states right, and yeah. would not be it comfortable with the... the word civil war was accepted. Uh, oh, yes, and yes, indeed, yeah. So as we look at this, how does how does religion come into play in, into this scenario of, uh, of right-wing extremism? Yeah. Uh, uh, and is it right-wing extremism? In other words, we can talk about left-wing, we can talk about right-wing, we can talk about the center right. in politics and in theology and religion and so forth. But uh, is it accurate to say that even to the right there is an extreme, as to the left there is an extreme? Definitely, so yeah. Th it is. Yeah, on both sides. So we have the liberal democratic society, ours at the center, and everybody looks like us, we hope, right? In a certain sense, Bush said. Well, um, yes. And then, of course, there is on the right and on the left, there are gradations in, to both sides. But the question now about religion, you know, um, if I, last year I was in Poland, or if I go to Yugoslavia, whatever, I see suddenly people who had been atheists for 50 years, for 70 years, and so mm -hmm. on. But suddenly when I come there, they say, well, uh, now we are Catholics again. Now we are Greek, uh, you know, Orthodox again. Now we are Islamic again. And one wonders what has happened. And I think what has happened is one becomes Polish again, in a nationalist sense. Or one becomes Hungarian again, in a nationalist sense. And to po being Polish belongs to be Roman Catholic. Well, that automatically identifies right. you then with exactly. that faith yeah. group. Exactly. So it is not that one suddenly has a conversion, but with nationalism comes also a certain myth of origin which legitimates the new authority and the new laws and so on. So one's personal beliefs may be something else, uh, uh, or, or, or may not even exist as paramount yeah. in their mind. Huh? In the group, a group of my students in, in Warsaw <laughs> picked me up from the airport and said, now, you know, uh, Catholicism has won, communism has lost. And so we talked about this further, and I said, well, are you all Catholics now again? Yes. And I said, well, do you know what Catholicism means, you know? It means to believe in God. It means to, have, you know, no birth control, no divorce, no premarital <laughs> sex, and so on and so on. He said, well, we will sin a little bit, and so on. Yeah, well, isn't there a similarity in our, in, in our society yes, here in America, well, too? We used to think of Catholic, yes. Protestant, and Jew. Yes, and right. you don't hear that so much now, because maybe it's, yeah. a, it's obviously become very inaccurate, I think, for describing our society. Yeah. But, I mean, but we used to use those terms. Yeah. yeah. But I, I told him, you know, you're hypocrites, and so on. So well, they said, we are not hypocrites. You don't mind being hypocrites. One was an atheist, even, you know, none of them was married. They all lived together. They all want birth control. But they said, you know, we are sinning a little bit, and then we are forgiven again, and so on. So it is not Catholicism, really. It is to be Polish. And to be Polish just means to be a Catholic. Are there certain strands of, say, the Christian faith, let's zero in on the Christian faith, uh, that uh, make it comfortable to be, uh, let's say, uh, pro-right wing uh, or nationalist, uh, as opposed to the other end of the spectrum, uh, being socialist or, or liberal or whatever you want to say? Are there, are there strands in the faith or something that that well, the, that give that loan themselves to that, or is it something in our in our psyche or something uh, in our uh, fears, our emotions that yeah. that kind of see us over to this kind of thing? I would say what what has been shocking for me when I recently read you know Hitler's writings again and so on, how very often he quotes, for instance, the churches or quotes Catholicism. Is that right? He agrees with Catholicism on uh, against he's against artificial birth control. He's against lesbians and homosexuals. You know, mm -hmm. um, he is for celibacy 
uh, as a means for the circulation of the elite and so on. So there are a lot of things and therefore it is understandable that for instance the bishops in 1933 thought that Hitler would contribute to the purification of the German soul, you know, in terms of group bathing and all kinds of things, and overlooked completely the concentration camps in which also Christians, you know, together with Jews and so on, labor camps and so on. So, and I, um, I think that this has something to do with a, a theory deficiency. The bishops did not know what was really coming, and I think what we are doing now is a very important issue. You see that, that we uh, overcome this theory deficiency and we know what's Yeah, what I, I would there. say this is uh, probably lacking in much of our Christianity, in much of our society. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, understanding uh, the theory and understanding the kind of mechanics of history yeah. and what goes on and what comes around comes around yeah. again and what gives rise and, and present this. You know, one thing that uh, I, I've noticed too and I've read in certain uh, places is that uh, there seems to be a, a revision of the Holocaust going on. Yeah. That is, uh, some people are either denying that it ever happened or they're kind of uh, lessening its imp or shrinking it in terms of uh, being, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, what we all think it to be, that maybe six million Jewish people lost their lives in the furnaces and uh, in some of these camps. There is, first of all, in Germany, you know, there's a so-called historica, uh, historian struggle, which wants to relativize the, uh, the crimes of Hitler by saying uh, uh, Hitler's Asian cruelty was a response to Stalin's Asian cruelty. So that makes it understandable. But I met, uh, during my trip uh, recently uh, in Germany, I met um, fascists from England and from Germany who say in two years nobody will believe in the Holocaust anymore. That's unbelievable. And their That's argument, you know, is very much on the technical level. They brought in, you know, people from gas chambers here, technicians and so on, and said this was not possible in, in, in Auschwitz and so on. So um, there is a technical level, and on the other side, there is a process of exculpation going on, you see. And the Germans now, the first time having their sovereignty again, said mm -hmm. we finished with this guilt trip now, you know. It's time to and, get, uh, on with yeah, get on with our lives. And these people, you know, they There's are... There's a certain amount of value to that, well, I guess. Yeah, but, but now they're very happy when these people come in and say the Holocaust never took place, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. So these two things which are is, meeting now. Yeah. Which is not yeah. true. Yeah. And uh, which even, uh, you know, in America, I understand, in the United States of America, we're doing some uh, revising, I think, of our history books and so forth uh, to give place to other cultures uh, and to maybe uh, look at uh, uh, the, uh, well, uh, our, our settling of the land, uh, uh, you know, in relationship to the, uh, to the Native American is, uh, is, is, is not a friendly, not a very good thing, you know, but nevertheless it happened. To try and present maybe a more balanced point of view, whether that's going to happen or not, I don't pluralistic know. pluralistic society is, of course, counter right wing, you see. So here we, we are building a wall against what, what may come, you know, like Oliver North or so, who is now running with $20 million, you know, for the Senate and so on. But um, I think, you know, in terms of this theory deficiency of the churches, of religion, you see, there are two things which the churches have to become aware of. First of all, what is the core principle of these fascist or nationalistic movements? And what are they, the churches, standing up for? Yeah, what's so, our core principle? Exa so, exactly, yeah. What? So, and I think uh, uh, Hitler had, you know, which he describes in the end of the first chapter of, the, uh, of my struggle, had a conversion experience in Vienna, you see. And then uh, it extended to Munich and so on, where he said, you know, don't we, this Aryan race, have the right to defend ourselves against this little people there at the Mediterranean. You saw that as an encroachment? You yes, think, yes. Uh... It was for him a matter of self-defense because he saw that Marxism was the secularization of Judaism. So therefore, for him, the Jews worked through Marxism, through communism, and as such constitute a threat of the Germanic nations, be it England or Germany and whatever. And this is coming up today, you know, in, in a new way. So, and uh, out of this, he was very upset for, for a month and so on, until fate somehow revealed to him the so-called aristocratic law of nature. It is the right of self-defense, but in reality, it's a social Darwinistic law of the right of the stronger to win over the weaker. And when Hitler was still in the barracks in Munich as a soldier after First World War, he brought bread along and there were rats and he fed the rats and one rat got bigger and bigger, the other rat was starving, finally the big rat ate the weak one. That was for him a symbol for the aristocratic law of nature. I see. And of course now the churches, you see, another law, the messianic one, which, which is, is a newer one, different. which is a newer one, 
which is represented, for instance, the symbol of the little lamb and the lion, or the, the lion who eats straw, and so on. That means the whole order that every organism lives only by destroying other organisms is turned upside down in terms of eschatology, in, in terms of the vision of Christianity. Really, I really Islam. worry about our own country here, too, because I just heard some figures today that suggest that uh, you know, our country's, our country's composition of population is changing, and changing very drastically. Uh, being uh, blacks, uh, Latinos, uh, Asiatic uh, immigrants, and so forth, are changing the landscape, uh, particularly in the cities, but it'll start to go out the landscape, where, to where, uh, you know, the white English-speaking sp people in this country, who really now control pretty much of the country, I mean, uh, are going to be in a very, very small minority. And I wonder what that's going to mean in terms of, uh, you know, maybe despots or some kinds of people, uh, you know, coming up in the nation and what, what we're going to be hearing in terms of having to protect ourselves or, or that kind of language. You know, that, that really bothers me that well, as as similar the, things can happen yeah. here. Let's, uh, you know, if you, if you see it from the European, of course, like here, the ruling classes in these nations are Germanic, right? So here also, there, there are German, there are Swedish, there are Norwegian, there are British, and so on. And so you have it over there too. And it's, the question is, how do these ruling classes, you know, uh, react to what is happening around sure. the globe? So, and this is where Hitler's name comes up, you see, where they say now in Budapest, so Hitler foresaw it, you know, the, the uh, growth of the Africans, the growth of the Asians, the Near Easterners, and so on. And he wanted to unite us, you know, in order to resist this. So. It is possible that people in, in Frankfurt, for instance, see there's almost no German anymore. I, I always ask in Frankfurt, where are the natives, you know? And so um, when people... You mean it's a very cosmopolitan place, Frankfurt? Yes, uh, right. Okay. And, and it is this, when they suddenly ask in all the German cities of Berlin, I say, where are the natives, you know, where are the Germanic tribesmen, and so on. Then, of course, this resentment comes out, out of which right-wing extremism grows. You I see. see yeah. the people feel threatened, and then they say, foreigners, out of the country, you see. Then they burn the Turks uh, to pieces, you know. Then they, th they burn the houses near Rostock, for instance, you know, of, of the gypsies and yes. so on. And people stand on the railroad bridge, you know, and jubilate as they burn the houses of the gypsies, the Roma and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is exactly where it comes from, right? Um, that the, uh, the ruling We've had that kind of violence in our, our own country, too, yeah. and we'll, not on that scale. Well, uh, but, uh, uh, you see, the, the ruling class is always a minority. The question is if the control mechanisms, you know, function well. The danger of a right-wing movement comes when one suddenly feels, look, the, uh, the increase of population, you know, yeah. among Asians, Africans, and so on, uh, is coming up, and, and suddenly, you know, we get smaller and smaller, and we lose control. At that moment, fascism comes in. So, okay. So one of the things we don't want to say is that, uh, as we talk about these things, that it can't happen here. On the other hand, now what then becomes the challenge and the opportunity, let's say, for Christianity in the United States. What, what are our opportunities and what are ch our challenges uh, in the face of a, of a changing, a changing society, changing landscape in this land? You know, in terms of uh, the ethnic, the, the people who are going to, uh, who are inhabiting it, and will be participating in the social process. You know, what. You know, you, you've talked a little bit about the messianic message or the yeah. messianic word. Right, yeah. All right. What things do we have to be well, saying and doing, really, I as Christian communities? The, the communities, you know, in their own interior, that means in their own inner world, you yes. know, have to uh, become clear about it if they really want to stand up for this messianic law, right, for this lion who eats straw, which is in a certain sense a, a perverse type of a lion, you see, that means he, <laughs> breaks, lion. he, no, makes, no, no. he breaks with the food chain, you see. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, somehow the Jewish prophets uh, 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 lifted humankind over a certain moral threshold. Hitler led us behind that threshold, you see. Almost to the I mean, you have to see threshold. that Hitler was a complicated fellow, you know. He had Schopenhauer in his back when he marched mm -hmm. in the First World War, you see. He was a social Darwinist, he was a Wagnerian, you see, he was a Nietzsche and, and so on. So all this stuff comes together in this fellow, you see. That's yeah. why they talk about his heroism and his, his uh, uh, tragedy and so on, right? So the question is, are the Christian communities still willing to identify with their own law, which in a certain sense is a utopian law, you see, because that line who eats straw has no place yet. Utopia, you see. No, he doesn't. It is a future vision 
right. in which uh, the just of all nations will come to Jerusalem and so on. Does one want to hold on to this, you know, or do we rather want to give up and say our main thing is self-preservation, you know, self-preservation of the leading race, you know, which invented the electricity and the tanks mm -hmm. and the airplanes and the cars and so on and so on. Uh, do we want to uh, stick to this supremacy? Mm -hmm. It is thinkable that a Germanic type of Christianity will sacrifice the Messianic law to the aristocratic uh, oh, of law of, uh, of, of nature, you know. And just not the Germanic form of Christianity. That has happened in Germany. Germanic, that has uh, certainly it has happened in Germany. Who were opposed to the, by the confessing Christians. So you had Christians split. One part held on to the, uh, to the Messianic law. The other one converted to Hitler's aristocratic law of nature. You know, when you think about, when you read the Gospels, and when you read St. Paul, even, in terms of talking about the message and power of the cross, that it's often really counterculture. Yeah. It is counterculture. But when we see most of the expressions of Christianity in this country, it seems to be that most of it is condoning the culture, or blessing the culture, uh, or uh, using the culture and the stuff of the culture somehow to say, hey, this is the results of Christianity, yeah. or this is, these, are the, these are the payoffs or rewards yeah. uh, of believing in Jesus or going yeah. to church or whatever the case is. Well, some is of that it is true, you see, and, and Christianity to speak at all has to accommodate to whatever culture and so on. The question is, extent. yes, to a certain extent, the question is the faithfulness or the betrayal, you know, of this of this messianic law. Yes. See, because the, the Hitler also talks about Jesus. Hitler thought Jesus was a great man, you oh, see. The fascists thought, of course, that, that Jesus had negated, you know, Judaism. And then there were all kinds of theories of the virgin birth, that this was no virgin birth, but that it was a, a Roman centurio. So therefore, uh, uh, the father of Jesus, therefore, he was then Aryan. And therefore, he was oh. such a great man because he was an Aryan, you see. All this can be uh, transvaluated. I it see. can be transformed, I you see. see. And that is what one does in terms of this Germanic uh, type of, of Christianity. Right? So this is much more than accommodation. It means that you take Christianity into service of a nationalistic movement in order through its uh, message, uh, myth of origin, to legitimate your laws and your authority and so on and so on. See? That should not happen from, from a Christian point of view. Right? Do you think in our society the electorate will continue to vote their pocketbook, that is, and the electorate, the, uh, the citizens will continue to vote the line of uh, self-preservation uh, and uh, protectionism uh, as we live in a, in a really a churning sea of changing values and things of that sort in this world. Well, we are in the, in the stream of things, you know. I mean, where do the nine million dollars which Oliver uh, North has, which come outside of Virginia, where do they come from? Where do the 11 million come from, from inside of Virginia? Obviously, nobody, not the poor people in Virginia, have 19 million people to give for, for the Senate race. No. You need only 40 million to go to the presidency. He has 20 million for just to go to the Senate, you see. Yeah, so see. obviously, there are rich circles, you know, who pay him. And the motivation of this is, of course, that he serves the self-preservation well, of this group, right? So um, while we, I think, should, uh, should be very sympathetic to anybody who wants to preserve himself, but the aristocratic law is not only self-preservation. It is the right of the stronger race, the stronger nation, the stronger corporation to eat the others if necessary, not to exploit the others and to kill the others if necessary. See? So um, the well, question we is... we talk uh, today, don't we, about uh, friendly versus unfriendly takeovers and mergers. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Seems to be standard the procedure among business. Rat business today. ate the smaller one. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. So the, uh, it is, I mean, what I would like to suggest, you know, is in all Christian groups, I mean, all Jewish groups, all Islamic groups, you know, to enter a discourse over these issues, because all these three prophetic religions have the uh, messianic law in common. Mm -hmm. And it is important, you know, since the onslaught will be enormous, uh, you know, that they are allied with each other and that they ally themselves with forces in liberal democratic society who, want, who insist on that this type of society goes on. That means that the formal structures of law and the transition of power and so on, that they are strong enough to hold on against this onslaught. To withstand um, this yeah, onslaught. With, with yeah, withstand this onslaught. And yeah. I think the optimum, I, it is questionable, you know, Fukuyama is right that this is the last society and, and all this, um, we because know. we have our contradictions which are pushing on. But I think particularly for the countries which I have visited, even with the Parti Quebecois in, uh, you know, in, in, in Canada and so on, 
um, I think that um, it is the optimum situation now if you have a parliamentary structure in which nationalists and socialists, let's say, can struggle with each other without killing each other, without throwing each other out of offices and so on. And in Croatia, I have really seen that. I gave a, a talk to the Croatian Sociology Association, and there were the fascists sitting on one side, the socialists on the other side. Now the nationalists all had leadership now, but the socialists were still there. They wrote their books and so on. In East Germany, in, in the faculty there, in, in, in the university where I taught there, there they had thrown all the socialists out, and the professors from the West came and took their positions, you know. So that is less, uh, you know, a good way to, to do it. So what so you first said, that's probably the best realistic scenario. I would say that it? in a yeah. complex modern society, problems are so complex that yes. we should ask, you know, let's see if the nationalists are voted in, then they should show if they can settle those problems. In Hungary, after four years, time. it was clear that they couldn't do it, and the socialists came back. If the socialists come to the end of the ropes and don't know what to do anymore, yes. well, the people may vote in, you know, center people or nationalists in, and, and they will show what uh, they but can at do. But at, at, at least they're not killing one another. That's right. That's yeah. what I mean, yeah. 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 So that it is a cultivate, that we, that we have a political culture, which we have built in this country, uh, where, where the transition can be made without uh, putting people like in East Germany before honor courts, and say, you spoke twice with the socialist government, you are out of your job. I see. I mean, out of 10 theology professors in the University of Rostock, yes. Rostock uh, nine were thrown out by honor courts because they had oh, spoken right? once, twice, three times with the, with the socialist you government. You mean that's all it takes? That's all it takes. Oh, that's, that's and how can a dean, for instance, of a theology school uh, prevent from talking to the government, the cultural minister sometimes, right? Well, I would hope, I would hope not. Right. No, yeah. no. So, I mean, this would be a, an optimum at this situation. And Christians have to factor themselves into this whole thing, right? Right. So, I mean, they cannot do it alone. I don't think that one group alone can resist this type of temptation. So. I don't because think it's so. tremendously powerful. Uh, the fascist temptation. It goes into the guts, you know, it's very emotional and so mm -hmm, on. Mm -hmm. So one has to find allies in the framework of the liberal democratic society um, who may or may not follow this aristocratic, uh, follow this messianic law, mm -hmm. but maybe in a secularized form, in That's a humanistic right. form, you see. And one has to be open for these alliances because mm -hmm. no group, the Islamic group, Jewish mm -hmm. group, uh, Protestant, Catholic group, cannot mm -hmm. do it alone. Mm -hmm. if, if it is possible to split them, yeah. Some of them will be okay. pulled over yeah. and the others go into camps. Thank you very much, Ruby, You're for informing us. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you on the program. And uh, we hope that uh, faith communities uh, can kind of hear what you're saying and uh, address these issues. And so on behalf of your local Lutheran congregation, thank you for watching Markings, and hopefully you will tune in again next week.